Hello and welcome to uh, uh, Undercover Capes Podcast Network special of George O'Connor's Charlie Spot Kickstarter that's going on right now as we speak and goes uh, through the end of November, right? Uh, November 30th, yeah, Monday at midnight. Well, George, thank you. Thank you for being uh, being with us and just being able to talk about this uh, Kickstarter. And, uh, you know, just from... Just a little backstory, man. Jo- George and I met a couple of years ago at a con, and um, I've become a huge fan of his stuff. And this really hit me. So why don't can you can you start a little bit and tell me how Charlie Spot started and where you got the idea and the germination of that? Sure. Um, so Charlie Spot, kind of like the the two sentence sum up is. Uh, after suffering a heart attack, a homeless veteran returns to his busking spot to find that it's become the epicenter of a turf war between rival buskers and street performing groups. Uh, it's the perfect spot right between the financial district and the city park. And he goes on this increasingly bizarre and frustrating adventure around the city trying to get his spot back. Um, it's, it's kind of in that classic vein of a simple story that just keeps spiraling out of control. Um, so that's, that's the pitch of, of Charlie spot. And the idea came from, uh, I had worked in downtown Boston for 10 years, you know, same route day in, day out for 10 years. And I noticed kind of like the same, however you want to describe them, the buskers, homeless, um, street performers, they all, so many of them were like in the same spot, spring, summer, fall, winter. Um, And after a while, after I started clocking that, you know, the same people in kind of the same spots, I just started wondering, like, there's got to be some sort of agreement. Like somewhere there, there's like a council meeting how everybody decides who gets what spot and that it doesn't turn into some sort of daily argument. And so that was it. It was just kind of exploring this idea of like, there's a whole different unseen community or, or hierarchy going on. Um, and that, that was just, that was the beginning of kind of the what if of Charlie spot. I, it, so it was, um, I got that from, uh, first of all, you t- taught me a new word. I didn't know what busker was. Mm. <laughs> so thank you for that. Of course. Um, and right from the beginning, and I think I, I think I might have even messaged you when I first started reading it that um, when when he has the heart attack on page three, right? Yeah. And that's all. I, like it immediately took me back because since uh, most of the podcasters know, I had a heart attack last year Mm -hmm. and so i at page three i instantly identified with charlie (laughs) and i was like (laughs) i was like okay so i felt pulled into the story immediately and then as i continued to read and um i don't know how much we want to give away uh, as far as like his background and what what he has gone through Mm -hmm. i i found myself identifying with charlie more and more until the point that um, it got me like very emotional. By the time I got to the end of the story, um, it, I I actually was I, like I actually was crying, and I couldn't remember the last time a book made me cry. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and and I apologize to you privately but I do hear <laughs> that like I'm sorry I made you cry, but like I'm really happy I made you cry. Yeah, so, and- you know those delicious tears. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I mean. I mean, we can, we can talk about, you know, Charlie all we want. Um, so, sure. yeah, you know, as I mentioned, you know, he's a, he's a homeless veteran. Um, yes. And, you know, the reason I kind of went in that direction um, and ultimately what kind of made me fall in love with him was around the time as this idea was kicking around in my head, uh, I was coming across a lot of TV shows that were kind of using the the crazy, insane, dangerous PTSD veteran. Yes. And when it happens once, that's, you know, like, okay. But like, like I said, in a short amount of time, I came across a bunch of different shows that were using that trope. Um, and it just... It, it hit... It didn't settle right with me. Um, because I, th- you know... Because I think what goes on is like 
there are plenty of people that do suffer, whether it's veterans or not, that suffer from PTSD. I and the vast, vast majority of them are quietly working on it. Like, you know, they are not a threat. They're not a danger. They're not crazy. They're not insane or anything like that. Um, and so, like I said, seeing that label being slapped on over and over again, just to move the plot forward, like I said, just kind of hit me wrong. So when I was thinking about, well, what type of person would find themselves in this position, you know, there is the trope of the homeless veteran, but I wanted to play with that. I wanted to tell a, tell a side that I'm sure is so much more um, accurate, whether that's the right or wrong word. But like I said, like all of us on some level are like quietly working through and on the things in our head. Um, and that, like I said, that's kind of what I wanted to put on Charlie. There's this quiet work that's going on with him that I wanted to explore. So I want to, um, congratulate you on, uh, on that because, um, I've, I've been suffering from PTSD for over 20 years and mm. dealing with that on, uh, you know, not me, if not on a daily basis, then it's 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 i would call it flare-ups <laughs> yeah. you know where where there are things that happen but the way the way i feel like you pegged charlie and i, I want to say charlie spot on but you were spot on on that <laughs> um because of uh you, you're right um ptsd does not necessarily mean that you're crazy and you're separated from reality or it's you're dangerous you're, 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 yeah, you're struggling every day mentally and yeah. to, just to be able to kind of function. And, um, from what, what Charlie had gone through and what I, what I think you kind of, kind of peel back the layers of the onion a little bit, uh, through the four issues is how that affected him and his relationship with his family and, um, and how he was, suffering silently to the point where he felt like uh i don't want to put anybody else through this yeah. you know and that um that to me the way there was a couple of scenes in there and and i, I want to ask you about the uh i think it was the third issue where yeah. charlie's sitting in the park and uh he has a, a run-in with one of the street performers mm -hmm. at least we could i think he's a street performer but his <laughs> the, his word bubbles are a different color which made me think that he was kind of a, a, a visitation maybe of charlie's mm -hmm. subconscious or um or what have you but that the, the 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 dialogue that you had in that exchange where uh Barry, he's talking to him about the park and what he's going through, but it really kind of juxtaposed his relationship with his family where you don't really kind of get into that. Right. Yeah. But if you read it that way, which is how I read it uh, of, of how his relationship with his family and his, he was trying to explain to himself why it was the way it was. Yeah. And that to me, that was, that was brilliance at that moment. And that, and that was, um, that was what struck me and which when made it, when you get to the end of the story, which I won't give away, but um, was, was really touching. And, uh, and I think that you're going to, uh, you're going to hit a lot of readers, I think where they live to it. I, I hope so. Um, that was, that was kind of the, the, as a writer, that was one of my goals with this is some of my favorite books are ones that can have you laughing in one part and then all of a sudden like out of nowhere they hit you with kind of like that true universal human honesty right. um you know kind of like my my north stars with this um terry moore uh with strangers in paradise or motor girl um that's some i love those books to death because of how they work that way uh, and maybe more recently, uh, Scotty Young with his Middle West and I Hate Fairyland. Um, I think those are two, you know, pieces where I wanted to try and get the Venn diagrams to cross over. Can I entertain you by making you laugh? Can I hit you 
humanely with, you know, hopefully what are some universal truths? And then also, can I give you a good comic book experience? Um, and that that was the one that maybe of the three was the late blooming part. Um, but working with uh, artist Meredith Laxton, who also co-created it, um, was fantastic. Where the conversations we had and the ideas she brought to the table, I think really helped like make this worthy of the comic book medium, if that makes sense. You know, using what comic books can do um, and playing with that to make sure that the three pillars were as strong as they could be. So, so tell me, tell me more about the collaboration of the of I, you with, with Meredith Laxton. And um, I didn't, so I didn't get the names of, so I see Pipitone and Esposito. Yeah. Yeah, um, so um, I will. Ha this is my favorite part of my <laughs> book. Please talk. Um, about so I was introduced to Meredith Laxton about. Uh, well, actually, I have the emails. July fourth, twenty eighteen, is when we were connected. Um, she was about to, or was a very recent graduate of SCAD in Savannah. Um, her portfolio was gorgeous. Where it it. There was, it was the humanity in her characters, the acting in her characters is again, what I really like in comic books where it's like, it's reality plus like, it's not, you know, it's not cartoony or anything like that, but it again, takes advantage of the media. Um, so like I said, her portfolio was just absolutely wonderful. And then we started talking and, you know, there was something about Charlie Spot that hit her as a human being as well as an artist. Um, and I think that's where the universe, you know, maybe smiled on us a little bit, um, that there was something in Meredith that wanted to do this book, you know, along with being a, a fantastic artist and someone looking to begin their career. Um, like I said, there was that little X factor. Yeah, that, that put the passion into it, um, and so we started putting the putting the story together. Um, early on, I was I was writing absolutely like full scripts for her, um, but then as we started working together and had conversations, and I saw how great she was at taking the script, but then finding moments to push or pull, add a panel, delete a panel. Um, that, you know, she's an incredible storyteller on her own. Uh, yeah. How much, how much easier does that make your job? <laughs> Infinitely. Um, <laughs> right. What really, what it comes down to is, well, I mean, a couple things at, at my heart, I'm a collaborator. I love kicking ideas around. Uh, I love playing what if with other creative people. That is, that is my greatest joy in whatever thing, whatever I create. Um, but then the other thing is, is in the conversations with Meredith and then seeing, you know, her incredible pages that she was producing, I realized I didn't have to have the answer for any, for everything. So there were specific scenes um, as we go into the book where like, maybe I know what the dialogue is and maybe I know where we are in the world. I don't know what the most interesting visual could be. Um, so I could just kind of essentially Marvel method some scenes. It was like, Meredith, this is what needs to be said. This is where we are. What do you think will be the most interesting thing to see and draw? You know, because whatever I put on the paper, it's going to be 10, 20 times longer for her to bring it to life. So, you know, every opportunity I have to let her own what she's going to have to live with. Um, as, as, as dire as that sounded, right. um, I wanted, I wanted to give her that opportunity and I can't think of one thing that she suggested change tweaked that I said no to, um, because like she, she knew what we were going for and her instincts and talent are fantastic. So that was, that was great. Like, you know, it was it Christmas and new year's every time I'd get a new page from her. So that, that was wonderful. Um, and then when we hit to the point where we needed to start coloring the book, she knew Ali Pepitone. Um, and Ali, again, beyond 
the talent talented colorist that she is um what i will always appreciate what she brought to the team was so she came in a year or so maybe a little more as meredith and i were plugging along and you know when you're in the middle of making the thing uh sometimes you forget the end goal the joy you know the the reason you started this in the first place right and ali came in with this enthusiasm and passion and energy that absolutely recharged me and like helped me remember why I love this book, why I was going to, you know, ultimately spend two plus years working on it just so we could start telling people about it. So, you know, again, on top of the talent, I will forever um, be thankful to her for bringing that energy enthusiasm and helping fuel that over the finish line. Uh, and then finally, our letter is Taylor Esposito. And the reason he is here is well, honestly because of Allie and Meredith. Um, so originally, I was going to letter this book. I've lettered every other book I've done, uh, and I'm fine. Like, you'll pick up my book. You'll be able to follow along. I won't get you lost. You won't pick it up and go, ew, and throw it back down. But <laughs> but I'm, I'm fine. As... Meredith and Allie were turning in pages. They were elevating the book in such a way, you know. Um, and even before that, um, I brought on a friend, Rich Duick, who's a fantastic writer on his own, to be the editor of the book because I wanted to be as good as I could be as a writer and a storyteller. So, so it just kind of hit me. If I'm doing everything I can to elevate the writing, Meredith is elevating the art. Allie's elevating it from the colors. Why do I want fine lettering on it? Like, why do I want to take, why, why do we want to go to the 10 yard line and go, awesome, kick the field goal? Like, right, right. That didn't make any sense. So, so that was the point of like, all right, let's bring in a, a pro letterer. Um, and Taylor, I, I had known the name for years. I mean, he's done everything under the sun, DC, Image, Dark Horse everybody like you know if you spend your time any of your wednesday in a comic book shop you've seen his name and you've read his work um and you know through comics twitter i knew he had a great reputation um but what sealed the deal was doing a small show around you know around the east coast and i'm just walking through artist alley and i noticed one of the writers there uh has a book and taylor's name is on it and so I start flipping through and the same professional level work that he gives image and dark horse, this guy's book was just as good. And that really sealed the deal that this is the guy I want to work with. Someone who takes a small 25 issue, you know, run for somebody to bring to a Northeast con. He's giving the same time, energy and passion to image and dark horse and all that stuff. Um, and then, you know, he's just forgotten more about lettering than I'll ever learn. So he was great to bring in and make sure we got this thing, you know, into the end zone and didn't settle for, for fine. Wow. So how, um, how is the Kickstarter going? I know we got a couple more weeks left and yeah. are you, how close are to you, you, you to your goal or, um, I think the last time I checked, we're like at 87%. 87 88 wow we, as of as of today um nine day uh eight days left so we seem to be going along fine you know we're plugging yeah. along um you know every day i'm seeing a few more people jump on board which is awesome um and one of the very cool like i don't know energizing things about this is this is the fifth comic book kickstarter i've run this is the fourth I've run in, you know, like the last two years. So really compressed and seeing the same people who aren't friends or family who discovered, you know, my work, our campaigns a year and a half ago, who just dig what we do coming back, you know, that's, yeah. And seeing like a good chunk of people who, you know, truly I've only met through Kickstarter and, you know, like I said, it's it's not the friends or family guilt or whatever. It's people who seem to dig what we do. And that's that's been very 
very cool and uplifting um, and, you know, strengthening. If that might be the wrong word, but, you know, it's 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 something I don't dismiss uh, because it's, you know, to, to be able to go, oh, I guess I have fans. Um, it's really kind of neat. <laughs> well, I, I'm one of them. So <laughs> thank you. Man. Um, I appreciate so, it. Can, uh, when so compare uh, this this book to um, your previous uh, your previous books um, because everything to me just seemed so different. Everything that you do, there's a, just a different spin. It's a different spin on something that maybe we've seen before. But this, so Charlie Spot, I've never seen a story like it. It's really, I've never seen something. I, I want to say this. It was, it's almost like it's like personal, you know? Well, I, I have uh, this, this conversation could shoot into three different directions and I'm me, which means it might. Um, so I will try and take your first question first, um, but we are also friends. So you feel free to guide me, cut me off however you want. I will not take offense. Um, okay. So. The previous, yes, I, I have noticed that I am terrible at branding um, because I'm not the sci-fi guy, the horror guy, the whatever guy. Yeah, but that's a good thing, though. I mean, I yeah. like seeing different ideas. I I, I, some, I don't know sometimes, um, you know, because, you know, I, I, I see people have success being the, you know, X creator. Um you know, the, oh, you know, so and so he does great horror. Uh, so and so she does great romance. You know, whatever terrible other cliches you want to throw out there on top of my terrible cliches, <laughs> um, because I know women love sci-fi just as much as men love romance. Um, <laughs> and I say that because my like my next project is a romantic comedy, so um, which I'm loving, by the way. Okay, back on topic. All right. Um. It, it is all different. Um, you know, the first book we did is called Healed. I did that with Griffin S. Um, and it's what would happen tomorrow if all life-threatening disease and illness went away today. So kind of like a grounded, serious sci-fi story. Um, after that, Griffin and I were kind of burnt out on the serious. And so we wanted to do something fun. And we did a book called Baby, which is kind of like Clifford meets Godzilla. Um, you know, the idea of the the trope spin being well maybe all these monsters destroying New York and Tokyo maybe it's not that they hate New York and Tokyo uh, they've just never walked on land before and it's just a big misunderstanding so we wrote an all ages book um, and then after that was uh, you know kind of timely it was called Silent Night and it was our idea of well what does Santa Claus do with the rest of his year. And we think obviously he'd be a crime fighting crime noir private detective using his Santa powers to help find lost children. Um, Which know. is brilliant, by the way. Thank you. That, <laughs> um, it was a ton of fun to create and then bring to life uh, with uh, artist Dafu Yu and colorist Leslie Atlansky. Uh, they're, they're a fantastic creative team and I love that book. Um, and then we've got Charlie Spot which is very grounded, but there is, you know, a literal and figurative magical element to it. Um, you know, it's supposed to be a little over the top and slightly over dramatic while having, hopefully having a very clear human heart to it. Um, I think the clear, the clear human heart overshadows the silliness aspect, which is great. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that was, that was the goal. So it's, it's kind of nice to, that's part, that's why we do it, right? Like we try and do things and then we just kind of put it out there. It's like, huh, did it work? Uh, but it, the only connecting tissue in all of this is it's what, what idea won't leave my head at that moment. Um, because, you know, I, I am, I'm at the grinding stage of my career. Um, and even in the best of circumstances, and I've been in some fantastic circumstances, this stuff is hard. It, it is hard. It is long. It can be frustrating when your collaborators are loving each other and everything's going as smooth as it can be. It's still hard. Um, and th But then life will always get lifey 
and life got lifey, you know, on this. Yeah. Um, you know, no one did anything. You know, it's not a right or wrong thing. Life just gets lifey. So if you're going to spend the time with a project and there is no like guaranteed monetary reward at the end, um, as I've gotten older, I've become a big believer in like, do what you're interested in and make the journey as enjoyable and hopefully as stress-free as possible, because that's all you can control. Um, after that, it's, you know, it's up to whatever, you know, God, spirits, luck, karma out there. Um, so I stick with things that interest me, you know, that, that I want to see into the world. And, you know, sometimes that's a grounded sci-fi story. Sometimes it's about Santa Claus and sometimes it's about a homeless vet going on a, and a, a big Lebowski esque uh, escapade around his city. Um, that, that's, one of the, that's one of the greatest things about, uh, about the passion about, uh, about comics is if you're doing something that you love, right. And that you, an idea that you love, you're going to find fans of the genre that that love what you just did, <laughs> you know, because yeah. of, because of the passion. If you, if the heart's there, it's gonna, it's gonna find an audience. I so. know this is the best thing I've written. Um, this m might be the best thing I've been a part of. That's what we could control. Um, you know, I, I recognize it isn't, it isn't a, you can't, it's not a three sentence pitch. Or a three-word pitch, or at least I haven't cracked that one yet. <laughs> so it it it's not the easiest thing to sum up for somebody, but it is the easiest thing for me to talk about and sell because I've got Meredith, Allie, and Taylor doing this amazing work that you know I can just take myself out of the equation and just yeah. look at how pretty this is. It's beautiful book. <laughs> yeah. Um how has how has the pandemic affected this project at all if it has um you know people had to move um you know uh ally teaches um like that's that's you know part of her major income and so she had to learn how to teach remotely on the fly um, you know, as well as just everybody kind of figuring out where the best place to be safe and hunker down is. Mm -hmm. So there were some hiccups. Um, and then also, I mean, uh, you, you can move the clock back as far as you want. I'll just, you know, play it safe and say for these last eight months. Um, I think that adage of, um, I don't know, the tortured artist making great work. Uh, I hope a lot of people realize how wrong that is. Great work comes from a calm mind. Yes. Um, and, you know, like I said, uh, for safety's sake, I'll say for at least the last eight months, um, it has not been the most calm, uh, I don't know, situation to try and create in. Uh, yeah. So... I will say, if anything, I'm, I feel fortunate that we were very, if we weren't already over the finish line, we were in the finishing touches stage. So, you know, less mental work. Um, you know, it's just harder to bring something from nothing to something. It just takes less energy to like do that final 2%, 3%, that type of thing. Um, yeah. And so that's where, that's where we were at. Um, also, it's a professional group. You know, um, yeah. great communication, great collaboration. Um, so we, you know, we, we went through it and we made sure we had each other's backs. You know, um, I think if anything, this project was, was also an exercise in, uh, empathy and support of your creative team. Yeah. And that was that, that, that flew around for everybody. How has uh, not being or maybe not being able to be uh, in person with the fans with no con scene this year and not, yeah, I mean, that's, that was hard on me and I'm just a yeah. fan. So how, how has it been with, uh, with the creators that, that kind of need to get out there to, to have people see their stuff? 
Uh, it sucked. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, you know, that's whatever. an easy answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah around, you know, around January, you know, I've been doing this. Yeah. You know, I've been doing cons for 10 years and, you know, I've been keeping semi detailed spreadsheets for five or six of it. So, you know, in January, February, I was looking at the shows I was going to do looking at past performance and going, all right, it looks like I need about these many books and blah, blah, blah. And so I did my ordering, like I said, whatever it was, January, February. And now, uh, you know, I got a basement full of books. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so that, yeah, like I said, that has, that has sucked. Um, but, the, but I also look at all of this as like, well, the, this is what, this is what we have to do. Like, you know, um, I don't fuck it. This might be too controversial. I'm gonna, but I'm gonna say it. Like this is real. This is actually happening, right? Um, and you know, we got to treat it with respect. We got to treat everybody with respect. So I understand why things were canceled. Um, I can, st I can still be bummed about it. Um, but still completely understand it. And, you know, I guess kind of like move on. Cause what else are you going to do? Um, you know, you, right. I will say my Kickstarter support since the pandemic started has been through the roof. Um, you know, because especially at larger shows like your New York's and your San Diego, I will put a good chunk of change budgeted just for walking around small press and Hardest alley to discover new things and to, you know, kind of put that good karma into the small press world, knowing full well, I would like to dip into that karma every now and then. Right. Um, right. So I haven't been able to do that. But like I said, my, my, the number of Kickstarter books, you know, and packages that I'm getting, especially now, um, I, I have made up for, for not being able to, to support artists face to face, at least through this way. That's a, yeah, that's a good thing. That's a, that's a, one of the things that, uh, that I miss about the con scene is getting yeah. out and actually meeting, uh, new creators, uh, because that's, that's like how I get to have people on my show is by yeah. actually, you know, going out there and introducing myself and, uh, and, and then I get to help you guys do Kickstarters and stuff. So that's, it's fun for me. Um, <sighs> So tell us how um, I, I I don't know if you can see the scroll underneath there, but mm -hmm. we can follow you on Twitter and yeah. follow me on Twitter. Um, but where uh, we could go to Kickstarter if you if want to uh, yeah. support your your uh, project, um, do you want to just give out that site? And oh, sure. Yeah. So um, if you go to my Twitter page, you know, so at Lazy Horde, um, the pin tweet is the tweet for the campaign. Uh, if you go to Kickstarter and just search Charlie Spot, it'll pop up as well. Um, the other thing I would I would like throw be, throw out there is if you also go to my Twitter page, what I've been doing every day of the campaign is I've been taking one panel from the first issue and kind of throwing it up there and putting like a quick little backstory behind the panel. Um, and it. It's a, it's a way to kind of, again, like my favorite thing about this is to show off Meredith, Taylor, and Allie. Um, and so this has been a fun way to not only, you know, put that spotlight on them, um, but also kind of talk about the book and, you know, bring people behind behind the curtain a little bit. Um, so you can check that out at Lazy Horde. If you want to check out more of my books, uh, homelesscomics.com is where you can read previews and order them for me and homeless comics is also on facebook just facebook backslash homeless comics all right well this is this is great i think um i think this is the best work that you've created so far um, <laughs> i th i think that uh that this is going to get out there and really kind of uh make an impact on uh, what's going on in comics? Uh, I, I see this. I see this book taking off more than uh, more than the the usual indie book that we look at. I appreciate it, man. I, this is the as far as like getting the book out there. This is the first. It's a big step, but it's the first step. Um, and I'm not gonna lie. That's my hope. You know, like I said, this the, a lot of work went into making this 
as good as it can be. And I, I am not one to give myself compliments that much. I'm one of those like dramatic creators, over dramatic creators. Um, but I truly can't think of how we could have made this book better. It at right now, November 2020, it's as good as we could have made it. Um, and I'm incredibly proud of that. Um, and I really hope people check it out. If you go to the Facebook page, uh, if you go to the Kickstarter page, we've got a four page preview so you can hear the tone, the vibe, and more importantly, you can just see how gorgeous this book is. And yeah, a hundred percent. Uh, it is a beautiful book. It, it is a labor of love, I think. And, yeah. and the passion jumps off the page. So thank you, bud. No problem. I, I I look forward to seeing how much success you're going to have with it. Um, so thank you very much, George, for being with me. And I I look forward to uh, to seeing you again once everything calms down. Can't wait. I, there's so everybody's getting so hugged. <laughs> I'm I you know I'm once it's like safe. I'm really looking forward to seeing what that first show is gonna look like i think it's going to be insane because i mean there's so many of us that have grown close through the con yeah. scene that uh, that haven't been able to see each other and uh yeah it's gonna i think it's gonna be a party yeah 100 <laughs> percent. all right all right so thank you very much george and uh i will talk to you soon thank you man take care all right so i'm gonna end the, oh wait i'm not gonna end Hold on. uh no, outro